Good morning and welcome. We're looking at Jesus' parable of the sower and the soil this morning. And in this well-known parable, Jesus describes a scene that would have been recognizable to everyone of his day. The farmer sowing seed in the field. He had a bag of seed and after reaching in and taking out a handful, he threw the seed out onto the ground. And as he did so, some of the seed would naturally fall in the ground that wasn't suitable, along with other seed that fell on good soil. Now fields in biblical times looked a little bit different to what we might picture. They haven't been prepared with modern machinery and crops planted in neat rows. In those days, the farmer would cast the seed all over the ground and then plow it under. The fields were in long strips with paths in between them so people could pass through. This was important in an area where everyone walked. Sometimes the Romans built their roads right next to the farmer's field. Sometimes the land next to the field was allowed to grow wild and it was full of thorns and weeds. In the ancient process of sowing, it was impossible not to have some of the seed fall or be blown by the wind onto these areas. And so to understand this parable, we need to understand the symbolism. And Jesus explains it to his disciples a little further on in Matthew's Gospel, still chapter 13. He tells them that the one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. So Jesus is the one who sows the seed, and the, the field is the world. The seed is the Word of God, and the various soils represent the diverse responses which people have to the Word which Jesus sows. Their response determines the degree of success of the crop. And so there are three things that I would like us to look at from this parable. Firstly, the seed falls onto every type of soil without discrimination. It's sown on the soil which is nothing but dry, packed earth. It's sown on soil which is full of rocks, soil which is full of thorns and weeds, and on the good soil. And I believe that one of the things that Jesus is saying here is that God doesn't play favorites. Even when God knows that the word won't take root in a person's life, he still gives them the opportunity to hear and respond. 2 Peter chapter 3 says, The Lord isn't slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Every person is given an opportunity to respond to God in some way. He speaks to them in their hearts. He reveals himself to them through nature. We're told in Paul's letter to the Romans that since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. The Apostle Peter had a revelation from God about this very issue. When God showed him that he cares about everyone, no matter their race or nationality or economic or spiritual condition, Peter says, I now realize how true it is that God doesn't show favoritism, but accepts people from every nation who fear him and do what is right. The King James Version puts it like this, God is no respecter of persons. That is why Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Sow your seed everywhere. When we go into the world sharing the message of Jesus, we become the farmer for him, sowing his word among those around us, sowing that seed. The worst sinner on earth will be given an opportunity to respond to God. The goodness of God isn't determined by our response. It's founded upon his character. The seed will be sown on every type of human soil, whether that seed will grow or not. And the second area we need to look at are the different types of soil, and there are four. They represent different responses of people. The first soil is found on the path, and the seed it finds it impossible to take root here. It can't penetrate the ground which is hard and packed dry. It's totally inhospitable and unrece unreceptive to the seed. This type of soil represents the cynic and the rebel. They have no use for the Christian life, even though they might be familiar with it. They see it as irrelevant and unworthy of their interest. They are unwilling to give the control of their lives to anything, even if it's God. When we have that attitude, the word of God can't live within us. And the problem isn't a lack of understanding, but an unwillingness to receive. It's not that they've never heard with their ears, it's that they've never heard with their hearts. Jesus said that they're ever seeing, but never perceiving, ever hearing, but never understanding. And so the fault isn't with the word, but their response to the word. The seed is good but the ground is hard. And the second type of soil we come across is a shallow, rocky soil. The people could see this kind of soil all around them. It was hard to find soil that wasn't rocky in the area. The surface rocks had to be cleared away every year. 
and in some places there was a solid shelf of rock covered by a very thin layer of soil. In this type of soil the seed would sprout up immediately, but it couldn't develop an adequate root system, and so it died as quickly as it sprang up. Jesus is talking about those who immediately receive the word of God with great enthusiasm, but they don't last. They have genuine joy in the beginning. They're excited about what it means to know God and experience a new life. But something happens, maybe an illness or problems or a crisis comes along and they, they can't understand why God would allow something like this to happen. They become cynical and offended at God and they fall away. Or maybe someone makes fun of their faith. A family member doesn't understand and is critical. Maybe it's the busyness of life that gets in the way and they become easily distracted. When they're faced with difficulties, they turn their other way because their faith is shallow. It's all enthusiasm without any strong, deep roots. The third type of soil is full of thorns and weeds. And Jesus describes this as the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things. These are what grow up and choke the word and make it unfruitful. It's still good soil. Things grow easily here. The plants are doing well. But the soil is crowded with other things. Other things have been allowed to grow that should never have been there. Perhaps the soil was outside the parcel of land that the farmer intended to be a part of his field. But it's also possible that Jesus was painting a picture of a farmer intentionally sowing seed on a land that was full of weeds. Maybe the farmer was a little bit lazy and didn't prepare the soil adequately. He should have pulled the thorns out by their roots. And because there was no effort to remove the weeds, the word had no chance to grow. The farmer is indifferent to the presence of the weeds. He didn't see the importance of removing them. He was passive and tolerant of what was potentially harmful. But the result was a harvest of thorns and thistles rather than food which would enable him to live. This kind of person is overly tolerant of the weeds in their life, which make it impossible for the word of God, God to take hold and to grow. They don't take sin seriously. Some people allow these things to crowd into their lives and choke the word. And then there's the good soil. These are the people who want the word to grow in their lives. Jesus said that the difference between the good soil and the others is that they hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. They want their lives to be fruitful for God. Their hearts aren't hard. They receive the word into their lives. They work the soil of their hearts, plow it, weed it, fertilize it, and therefore they're productive. The soil of their lives produces an abundant harvest. It's not that these people are more talented. It's simply the result of the effort and time invested by those who receive the word. These are people who desire the word of God and are eager to grow in him. The soil of their lives is receptive to the word. They hear it with their hearts, accept it into their lives, and then they're spiritually productive. They're not sidetracked. They understand that there's effort and commitment involved in living a Christian life. They're willing to pay the price of whatever it takes to grow spiritually. They're not just playing at being Christians. It's their life. They want to know God. Their lives are good, rich, deep soil. One of the important things that this parable is saying is that God expects growth. It's the natural result of good soil and careful preparation. The parable asks us to consider what kind of soil we are. Are we a hard trodden path? full of rocks with a shallow layer of soil? Are we riddled with thorns and weeds? Or are we good, fertile soil? And the third point I want to highlight today is one of the aspects of this parable which I find so encouraging. In spite of all the poor soil, all the trouble that the seed had growing, in the end, there was an abundant harvest. And I believe that in the end, God will have his way. In spite of all the types of soil that didn't take root, the good soil was more than willing, more than able to make up for it. At first, the seed may seem small and unimpressive, and we may think that there's hardly any seed growing because of all the obstacles it faces. But the good seed multiplies and causes the word to grow in so many places. The harvest is 30, 60, 100 times more than what was sown. And we need to take encouragement from that. And so to sum it all up, this parable is about the cycle of sowing and reaping telling and hearing, sharing and responding. We all know people from each of these different soil types, and most of us shift between one soil and another from time to time, depending what's happening in our life. 
I know we'd like to believe that we're all good fertile soil all of the time, but if we're honest, we probably aren't, at least not all the time. Have you ever met someone that you immediately sense is just such a holy person? There's something about the way that they move and live and have their being that speaks to you on a soul level. We might say that they're living in the spirit and how we long for what they have. But we have those qualities as well. They're the seeds that were first planted in us when we heard the word of God from someone who sowed into our life, who nurtured us by baptism, enriched us by coming together in community for strength and renewal. Seeds sown in the good soil of our hearts blossom into the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And if the seeds of God's love flower into these fruits, then what do these new seeds look like? There's pollination and cross-pollination and new growth all over the place. And the cycle of sowing begins again, and God's abundant love sees to that. We go about our daily business living in faithfulness in God's abundance and being sowers amongst those whom we encounter. We might not often get to see where the seeds fall, but the point is that we continue to sow. The church's mission and our mission is to spread the good news to every end of the earth. Archbishop William Temple said this, The church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. The church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. And this still holds true for us today. There are infinite ways for us to be the church he describes. We are both the sowers and the soil. Without the one, the other wouldn't make sense. As we go into the week ahead with whatever it may hold, let us rejoice in the power of the Spirit. May we sow abundantly and may the seed that is sown in you bear the plentiful fruit of God's love. Amen.